I, I'd like to thank uh, Jame and uh, UPF for inviting me to, uh, to talk about this topic today. When Jame uh, gave me the topic of uh, today's talk, it was basically when do we think that the current global panic or global crisis is going to be over. I couldn't resist going back to an old uh, British television show uh, where there was a character, an old lady, who was always saying, when's it all going to end? That's what I'd like to know. When's it all going to end? So I chose that for the title of my talk. Uh, I hope I'm going to be a little more optimistic than, uh, than she was typically on, on, the, on the show. Uh, I'd like to uh, frame this. First of all, let me tell you in advance that uh, most of the of the evidence I'm going to be drawing from is taken from the United States. Now, um, that's because I guessed in advance that uh, Jordi and Javier would have more to say about the European context, uh, and I would be happy to jump into that debate later. But I'd like to frame this initially on where the current global crisis began, uh, and it was, uh, I have some evidence that I'm, I'm going to show you that relates to that situation. Uh, and again, I will try and um, also think about uh, the European and British situations. So there are three things that I want to focus this talk on. The first is that it's not really possible to give an unconditional answer to the question uh, of when the global crisis will end, because policy matters. And getting policy right is, I think, an extremely important component of, um, of, the, of the task we have in front of us. And although I'm based at UCLA, I've been spending the year at the Bank of England, and I'll be there until the end of December. Uh, and one of the things that I'm trying to do in the UK uh, is to persuade the UK Treasury and the bank to engage in uh, a somewhat more interventionist policy than they've been engaged in so far. And I'll talk about that uh, as we go through. The, the new aspect of the policy that I'm thinking about is, co is connected with the, the relationship between the stock market and economic activity. Uh, I, in my view, uh, we, we talk about the financial crisis. Um, we often don't recognize that, well, we do recognize that huge financial crises have long-lasting impacts on all of us, on unemployment, on the, on the quality of living. And my view is that once we recognize that crises like this begin in the financial markets, we should also recognize that their solution is in the financial markets. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk about the role of central banks uh, up till now, uh, and I'm going to talk about an extension of a policy that's called quantitative easing, uh, which is really something quite different from what central banks have been doing in the past. And the policy that I've been advocating for the UK Treasury uh, is one which is really an extension of that policy uh, in, um, in the financial markets in general. So let me begin with this idea that policy matters. This, uh, this picture shows you the unemployment rate in the United States beginning in 1890 uh, and ending in 2011. And there's a line in the middle there, and that line follows uh, something that was called the Employment Act of 1946. So the break point in, in the 1930s, after the Great Depression, and in the, in the midst of the Great Depression, an English economist, John Maynard Keynes, uh, wrote a book that really transformed the way that we think about the way that Western economies work, that capitalist economies work. There were, I think, three uh, important arguments in that book, uh, at least two of which I, I think we've forgotten. And one of those is that, uh, left to themselves, market economies can get stuck with very high unemployment for a very long period of time. Um, he saw high unemployment as, as an equilibrium of the system, and that's one of the ideas that I think we've forgotten since the 1930s. Um, the second idea he introduced was that it's confidence in the markets that selects which equilibrium we're in. That one, I think, has come back with a vengeance following the, the 2008 crisis. And the final idea was that there's something we can do about it as a society. So before 1946, 
the idea that, that governments had some role in trying to maintain full employment was completely alien. There, there were two sets of policies introduced in, in the 1940s and, and after the Second World War. One of those was that central banks took a much more active role in counteracting uh, recessions. So I'll show you evidence of that in a minute. And the other was the introduction of uh, what, what we call automatic stabilizers, meaning that the role of government became much larger. And uh, when the private economy expanded or contracted, uh, the, 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 the government sector did not. And that put a break uh, on, on what could happen. Um, I've argued that the stock market matters. And here's some evidence of that. So what you're seeing here is uh, the, the stock market um, in the Great Depression. So, um, this is beginning in 1929 and going through to the beginning of uh, World War II. The blue line is a measure of the value of the S&P 500 and it's, uh, it's measured on the left-hand axis, so we're moving here uh, between 4 and 32. That's just an index number. The red line is the unemployment rate. That's measured on the right-hand scale on an inverted scale. So we're moving here from zero to uh, 35%, 36%. So notice the way that unemployment, the increase in unemployment follows the big crash in the stock market. And there's a very close correlation between those series over the whole period. Now, uh, in, in the work I've been doing, I've shown that that connection holds not only for the 1930s, but right through the post-war period. Here's evidence from the most recent financial crisis. I should say here that the gray bands that you're looking at are re recessions that are dated by the, the NBR Dating Committee. So the Great Depression, you'll notice, was actually two separate recessions. There was a big uh, drop in economic activity in 1929. Uh, the recession was called over in uh, in 19, I can't read my own graph here on, on the side, in the early 1930s, 1933, it began to recover. There was a second recession in 1937, but we really didn't come out of the Great Depression until the economy geared up for World War II. Uh, you're seeing something similar here. In, this is the beginning of the recession in the end of 2007. Again, the recession was called over uh, at the end of 2009, but we've had a very slow recovery. So unemployment in the United States uh, is still, uh, I ended this, this graph ended in 2011 and I didn't have time to update it, but the unemployment rate is still hovering around eight, nine percent uh, even now. So the point to get from these two uh, graphs is that there's a very strong connection between the value of wealth as measured, financial wealth, as measured by the stock market and the unemployment rate. And Keynes's explanation of that, and I think he was right, is that it's a causal relationship. Uh, if we feel poor, we are poor. If the, the value of the dividends and earnings coming from, if, if the value of the stock market crashes, uh, people spend less, uh, consumption goes down, investment goes down, uh, employment goes down, and the crash becomes self-fulfilling in the sense that once there's nobody working, there's nobody to produce dividends to make the stocks have value. Uh, the, the third piece of information that I want to draw attention to is that central banking has been important in helping to mediate against recessions in the post-war period. Uh, here you're looking at data from uh, 1985 through 2010. I could have gone back further. Each of these gray bands is an MBR recession. And the red line is the unemployment rate. This time it's measured uh, on a 0 to 12 scale. And the blue line is the interest rate on three-month treasury bills, which is essentially controlled by the Federal Reserve. 
And you'll notice that in each of those three recessions, and this extends back beyond this as well, the response of the Federal Reserve to an increase in the unemployment rate was to lower the T-bill rate, to, lo to, to lower interest rates. Um, once the economy started to recover, interest rates would go up again. But since the 1980s, there's been a downward trend in interest rates and uh, an upward uh, a downward, also a downward trend if you would extend this back in unemployment rates. And notice what happens when you get to the 2008 recession. There, the Fed tries to do the same as it's done in previous recessions, but the interest rate falls quickly to zero. Uh, and at that point, um, at that point, the Fed essentially ran out of bullets. There was nothing else that central banks could do. Uh, and we entered a situation very similar to the Great Depression. So what makes the 2008 recession, in my view, very similar to the Great Depression is that in both cases, we ran out of the ability of monetary policy to get us back on track. Um, how bad is it? Well, there are two ways of answering that question. Uh, this is a, a, a graph that you'll see often on, on the economic blogs. And it's showing, um, it, it's showing uh, payroll employment in the United States for each of the last six recessions. And in each case, I've normalized payroll employment at the beginning of the recession to 100. And I'm looking at how many months it took for the economy to recover. So if you look at, whoops, if you look at um, the blue line, the blue line is the first recession. That was the, the 1974 oil price shock. Uh, employment went from, from 100, it fell by about 2.5%, a little, a little under 2.5%. And it had recovered in about um, two years, 20, 25 months if I'm reading that correctly, maybe a little longer. So along the bottom here, you're seeing the number of months since the employment peak. If you look at the 1980 recession, that's in red, that was again caused by a, peak, uh, a spike in the oil price. That was a much milder recession. Employment fell by about 1% and it recovered within the space of the year. Again, uh, 81 recession, the 90 recession, the 2001 recession was more protracted but shallower. And what you're seeing at the bottom here is the 2008 recession, uh, which the, the employment peak here was in January of 2008. And um, this graph ended uh, in, I believe that's ending in around 2011. So again, so these are months after the peak. And if you ask yourself, if you define the end of the recession as when will um, payroll employment get back to where it was before the, before the recession began, there's a very clean answer. Uh, it will take another 25 months and it will be uh, March 2015. So for those of you who like clean answers, the answer is the recession will be over in March of 2015 in the United States. Um, now, that's not a particularly useful answer because uh, the economy is growing, the number of people is growing. And uh, that doesn't say anything about what the unemployment rate will be in March 2015. Uh, and it doesn't say anything about what employment as a percentage of the population will be in 2015. So if you want that number, uh, here I've I've plotted a different graph. This is the employment to population ratio. Uh, and that's, so in other words, take all the people over the age of 16 in the United States, uh, put that in the denominator, and in the numerator, there is the, the number of people working. So that was 44% of Americans over 16 were working in 1950. That gradually increased. A lot of this increase is women entering the labor force. Uh, and that trend reversed around about 2000. And the employment to population ratio, which has not only the secular trend, uh, it also has cyclical pieces. 
And, and notice that the end part here, which is, this is 2005, this is 2010, so that's the beginning of the Great Recession. The employment to population ratio fell from around 60% down to about 57, and that picture doesn't look as, as if it's going to recover anytime soon. So there's a lesson to that, which is that recessions appear to have a permanent component. So you know, just looking at uh, what's happened to uh, the labor force is not good enough. The unemployment rate appears to take permanent hits, and I think we should be concerned about that. Uh, it's, often, it's often attributed to uh, variations in what people call the natural rate of supply-side factors. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think that demand factors are very important in having a permanent component uh, to recessions. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of what those graphs show you, they show you that policy matters. Uh, and it's important as well to note that both of those projections hinge on the assumption that policy will continue to be active. And I don't know if any of you have been following the markets, but two days ago, Ben Bernanke uh, made a, a rather mild statement, which is that the quantitative easing that the Fed had been following um, might be ending within a year or slowing down. Uh, to put that in perspective, the Fed's been pumping about 85 billion a month into the US economy. Merely the mention that that might be ending about a year from now caused the markets all over the Western world to tumble by three or four percentage points in two days. Um, so I think we should ask ourselves a question. And that is, you know, is there something we can do once we recognize that policy is important that would be different moving forward? And my answer to that question is very much yes. Uh, and uh, I'm going to argue that uh, although monetary policy was relatively effective at helping prevent recessions from being as deep as they might have been uh, in the post-war period, monetary policy, at least in the US, is hampered with one instrument uh, and, and two targets. What do I mean by that? Uh, the, the instrument that the, the Federal Reserve has been using is the overnight interest rate. So really since the inception of central banking in, in the 17th century, uh, central banks have gradually been learning how to operate. And since the 1980s, they've been operating um, using a policy called inflation targeting, where uh, they raise interest rates if expected inflation appears to be getting too high, and lowering them um, if uh, expected inflation appears to be falling. And in the, in the US, and this differs across central banks, there's a second target, which is growth and employment. And um, it's the fact that the Fed has been concerned about the state of the real economy that led to those uh, dips in interest rates following a recession. Um, well, we've known for a long time as economists that if, if a policymaker has two goals, but only one way of achieving those goals, sometimes those goals might conflict. So if you look at what's happening now in the United States and you compare it with, say, the United Kingdom, both of those central banks, the Bank of England and the Fed, have completely lost control over both of their instruments. The interest rate's at zero. Once it's at zero, there's no way of moving interest rates to control inflation. So we have a situation in the United States where uh, the, the inflation rate is underperforming. It's less than the 3% target and has been for some time. Um, and we have a 2%. And we have a situation in the United Kingdom where uh, inflation is above target and has been now for two or three years. Even in normal times, I would argue that that interest rate tool is not enough uh, to achieve both targets. So the second instrument that I've been arguing for in the UK is to directly target the stock market. So let me say what I would mean by that. Um, so let's get the transmission mechanism down and then I'll explain what I'm, I think is the way to operate. The transmission mechanism is that when we feel wealthy, we spend. When we spend, 
unemployment falls. When unemployment falls, profits and dividends rise, and that validates the increase in the value of the stock market or in wealth that, that began it. Uh, there's been... Um, uh, you know, what happens in a, in a major recession, like the recession that followed from 2008, is that people become extremely apprehensive about holding any risky assets. Now, in that situation, I believe, there's a role for government in the form of the Treasury slash Central Bank to step in and provide uh, safe assets for the public. So how would they do that? Well, the Treasury or the, or the, the bank or uh, conceivably the ECB, but there are, there's a lot of issues that I want to be very careful about jumping to the European situation because there are so many more issues to think about that maybe I can address later in questions. But I would have a central bank, like the Bank of England, set up uh, what's called an exchange-traded fund. So an exchange-traded fund is an index fund, and it would be defined over the entire stock market. So the Bank of England or the Treasury in England or the Fed in the United States or a central bank would announce to the private sector, go out and create these funds, and they would be value-weighted, and ideally uh, would contain every publicly traded stock. The, the Treasury or the central bank, and this is basically, remember, this is going to be a fiscal operation, essentially, would buy shares in the exchange-traded fund uh, in exchange for debt. So I imagine the Bank of England holding $150 billion in in an exchange-traded fund in the stock market on the asset side of its portfolio, and on the liability side of its portfolio, it would be holding, it would be issuing long-term long -term gilts, bonds that uh, it, currently it can borrow at at a very low rate of interest. It would announce that that exchange-traded fund, which is currently trading at, say, 100, as of next Thursday, will be trading at 120. And over the following month, the fund will be increasing at 3% per month. So just as we have a committee in England, the Monetary Policy Committee, that announces a price path for interest rates, I would have a parallel committee, the Financial Policy Committee, announcing a price path for the value of the market. If unemployment is too high, I would increase the rate of appreciation of that fund. If unemployment was too low, I would decrease the rate of appreciation of that fund. Summary. We learned how to operate monetary policy to generate price stability, and it's taken us 300 years to do that. So if you go back to the inception of central banking, central banks have evolved, and we've learned a lot. We made mistakes. We learned a lot in the 19th century from financial panics. I think we learned a great deal uh, in the post-war period, and in my view, monetary policy since 1980 has been a great deal more successful, if we exclude the Great Recession, than, than before that date. I think that it's time to start thinking about the immense harm that financial instability is doing to our economies. Economic theory teaches us that price earnings ratios, the value of the stock market relative to the dividends and earnings that the market is generating, should be roughly constant. In reality, price earnings ratios have varied historically between 5 and 50. And those enormous fluctuations in price earnings ratios have enormously bad effects on the real economy. Uh, I think that learning how to control those financial fluctuations as an alternative to traditional fiscal policy uh, is the way to prevent this kind of crisis from affecting us so badly in the future.